Nehemiah is now launching a major project. He's going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now here in chapter three, we're, we're given a long list of people who join him in this great work. This list proves that Nehemiah is a careful and strategic administrator, planner. Otherwise, it would have looked like a, a three-ring circus rather than a construction project. Now, we're, we don't have time to read all the names here, but I want to highlight some of, the, some of the people and the attitudes that are demonstrated by these faithful workers. And, and let me tell you, we ought to have these same attitudes in our lives and certainly in the church today. And the first point I want to highlight is that the people work willingly. Some of them are assigned to repair the walls. Others are assigned to work on different gates in the city. Other people are assigned to pick up all of the rubble and trash and cart it all away. I can remember one summer as a college student having a job loading a dump truck full of trash at a construction site. Let me tell you, that wasn't a fun job. Well, that's an assignment here, and every willing person is involved in some way. Verse 1 even tells us that Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. I love that fact. Even the high priest is rolling up his sleeves, getting some splinters in his hands. Now, many of these workers are unskilled. They didn't get a degree in engineering. They weren't apprentices, you know, with a brick mason, never built walls or or gates before. But I want you to listen to verse 8. Azael, the son of Harhiah, goldsmiths repaired. Next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, repaired. Next to them, Raphiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. (laughs) What's a goldsmith, a perfume maker, and a politician have in common? They're all willing to do something they've probably never done before. And let me tell you, beloved, anybody who wants to serve the Lord needs to be willing to do sometimes whatever needs to be done. Maybe learn how to do something they've never done before. Nehemiah's people here are simply willing to work. My father was a missionary leader for over 65 years, and I remember him telling me the story. One day, a young man came for an interview, interviewing for a key position there at the headquarters, My father was in the process of mopping the floor to clean up a spill. When this young man introduced himself and said he was there for an appointment with the executive director, my dad just sort of leaned on his mop and said, well, that would be me. Well, this young man was shocked. He said, if I were in your position, I'd never mop the floor. I'd get somebody else to do that for me. Well, that young man wasn't hired after all. The people worked willingly. Secondly, let me highlight the fact that they worked zealously. Verse 20 mentions a man by the name of Baruch. Some Bible versions translate the Hebrew here as saying, he worked zealously. That is, he worked eagerly, repairing a section of the wall. You know, it's one thing to do a job half-heartedly. It's another thing to put your whole heart into the work. A man named Mermoth repaired two different sections of the wall here in verse 4 and again down in verse 21. The Tekoites here from the village of Tekoa repaired sections as well, we're told in verses 5 and 27, even though their town leaders, by the way, refused to help. We're also told here in verse 12 that many young women also got involved in the work. Now, Nehemiah strategically assigns people to repair the wall near their own home. This is, frankly, a brilliant idea. For example, verse 10 tells us, Jediah repaired opposite his house. Well, this strategy encouraged work uh, of excellence. 
Thirdly, the workers could be characterized, let me highlight this point, as working harmoniously. That is, they, they're working side by side, restoring these walls. Well, you can be sure that when God's people are, are diligently, willingly, zealously uh, working harmoniously, well, the devil is going to start working overtime. And in chapter 3, you have people embracing this opportunity, as we've seen. But now in chapter 4, the opposition begins. Now keep in mind, Jerusalem isn't just any old building project. It represents the very center of God's plan for all the nations. But certainly the worship of God in this central location is going to be so key, critical to the nation of Israel. So the restoration of the city of Israel, Jerusalem, this capital city, that's going to be a terrible blow to the unbelieving, idolatrous enemy nations living around them. And so, once again, you've got Sanballat and Tobiah showing up. They're going to lead the opposition. They use a variety of methods to oppose this project, and and the first method, we could say, is verbal ridicule. Verse 1 tells us that in anger, Sanballat jeered at the Jews. He mocks them here in verse 2, saying, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they revive the stones out of the rubbish? Tobiah chimes in here, verse 3, yes, What they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. In other words, this this wall is so flimsy that if a little fox hops up on it, he's going to make it collapse. Well, this ridicule stung. I'm sure of it. No one likes to be made fun of. But Nehemiah doesn't publicly respond to their mocking. He doesn't get out a bullhorn and, you know, holler insults back over the wall. Instead, Nehemiah just prays. He takes it to the Lord. He wisely recognizes that these people don't just hate him. They really hate God. He prays here in verse 5 that God will ultimately vindicate himself by his judgment of these enemies. You see, Nehemiah is more concerned about God's reputation than his own. But in a way, Nehemiah does respond to his enemies. And here's how. Verse 6 records, So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height. Let me tell you, that's the best way to respond to your critics. Just keep on praying, keep on working, keep on walking with God. Well, the second method of opposition now takes place. It isn't just verbal insults. It's physical threats. Verse 8 says, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem. Now, we're not given the details of their plot, but it is life-threatening. When the Jewish builders become aware of it, instead of quitting, we're told here in verse 9, they set a guard day and night. Well, with that, the Jewish people now, they've hurdled uh, verbal ridicule and physical threats, these obstacles. Uh, but the enemies aren't finished. Thirdly, the opposition comes in the form of, of what we could call emotional discouragement. The enemies of the Jews plant seeds of discouragement among the Israelite people, and, and those seeds begin to take root. So now listen to what the people begin to say here in verse 10. The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. Beloved, uh, discouragement is, is one of the devil's most successful weapons against believers to this day. It has a way of growing and spreading to others. If it's not dealt with, it can stop some important work for the Lord. So Nehemiah takes it seriously. He calls all the people together And he gives them another inspired pep talk here in verse 14. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, 
and your homes. You know what he's saying? He's saying, look, God is bigger than our enemies. So let's keep trusting him. Let's get better prepared. Let's be prepared to fight. We have to. But let's keep building this wall. Well, here in verse 16, Nehemiah sees that the workers now are armed with weapons just in case they're attacked. He establishes an ingenious alarm system in verse 18 where the blowing of a trumpet will signal where an attack is coming from so that everybody can rush over there and help out. And finally, here in verse 22, Nehemiah instructs all the people now to begin staying inside Jerusalem each night, and they station guards now around the clock. Well, with that, the wall is halfway built. The enemies are ramping up their threats. The Jewish people, praise God, they're refusing to quit. Well, what happens next? Well, we'll get to that in our next wisdom journey together. And until then, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.